Uh, I have not confirmed that. I'll have to look. This <laughs> is. That's right. That's right. I have totally dropped it. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's good. All right. So most people submitted a homework solution that looks something like this. Basically, filling in the function should take about two lines if you use the daytime library and strip time and weekday. So that was like a majority of submissions. I wanted to show off some creative solution, and then obviously it passed the test, so you're good to go. So that was if that was your solution, good job. See if we can find a more elaborate one. Uh, that was even one line, which is even shorter. Okay, this one I I don't know who did this, but I was awfully impressed, and I just wanted to show off the hard work they did. I don't even understand the math that they were doing at this point, <laughs> but I mean they they take in the date time string, and then like they do a bunch of math, and they end up with the right calculation, which I was really impressed by, because like I can't do that, so good on whoever did that. <laughs> no, it's not voluntary. All right. So, anyways, it passed the test. Great job. And then I think someone used pandas, which I didn't even like think of. So, pandas can even do it in short, in a shorter code. So, like, good job. So that was cool. Only I think I only had like one or two people delete the test from the function, and then didn't write a function. I was just like, what is that about? I didn't understand that. The goal was not to delete the test. All right, leg block. All right, and these these notebooks are going to be they're in Blackboard now. So if the things that I'm showing you, I've stolen your notebooks and put them on Blackboard. Let's see what we have here. All right, so the, for the leg plots, it pulls up. Again, I really like when people put the description of the assignment at the top of the cell, because that helps me know that you know what you're supposed to do, or at least you copy pasted it in there. So that's helpful. Um, obviously, reading the Excel spreadsheets, that shouldn't present a challenge. That was uh, pretty straightforward. And then, <coughs> let's see. So the, and I, and I don't know if I didn't explain this efficiently, or like a lot of people had questions. There were two columns. One was the sort of like time index, and the other was the value. And so the part that was missing the data, that's what we were supposed to plot the lag plot on to figure out whether or not that data was ordered or not. So it, it doesn't make sense to like do a lag plot of timestamps because those are timestamps. So you need to check whether timestamps are ordered. Uh, let's see. All right. So then this one was pretty nice because I got to see the distributions, the histogram of all three data sets all side by side. So that's pretty convenient. The most common problem that I ran into with the histograms was that the number of bins was like, if you put in 100 or 1,000, you lost sort of the resolution of what exactly your data was showing you. So here, if you just take the default of 10, it's a reasonably safe bet. It may be, uh, you know, you could get slightly better understanding of the data with slightly a few more bins. But the default of 10 worked for most of these plots. Um, and that's a, there's a reason it's the default. Um, so taking more than 10, some people got off because like I couldn't actually tell what the histogram was of. If you had like a thousand bins in there, it's all flat and it doesn't you lose all the information. Okay, so then lag plots, pretty straightforward. Either it had structure or it and then interpolate was the sort of the go-to solution there. I even gave you the name of the function, so interpolate the data. That's only applying to the miss. <laughs> right? This is the magic of programming. Someone else did the work for you. Uh, right. And then here's here's like a, a pretty standard solution to the sampling from the distribution for the for the random data. So like basically they took all the data and then they said ignore everything that's a NAN and then use that column to get a list of values, and then we're going to fill in the empty values with those list elements. That's significantly different than if I take all my missing values and I fill them in with the mean value or the median. That's not going to be a one. And I don't have a quick go-to example here, but what that typically showed up for 
is if someone used the mean on this plot, if there was a very dark band here because they filled in all the NAND values with the mean, and it clearly didn't represent the original data set. All right, I think, yeah, that's all I have there. All right, so again, those notebooks are posted. I'll close that. Are there any questions or comments on the lag plot or date string? Yeah. So I went a different way with sample, uh, um, sampling the non-null values from the you know, case because I was worried that if you know there was a clear positive linear correlation, is that right? I'm trying to remember which data set it was. And okay. Uh, maybe. Yeah. This is the one with the Gaussian. Yeah. Distribution. Okay, so with a Gaussian distribution, I was worried if you filled those without accounting for there being a Gaussian distribution to them, that you're going to have, it's going to mess up your... Sure. Right? So I decided to use the interquartile range and just use those values and then select randomly from those values. But you're selecting from a uniform distribution, I believe. But that was your complaint about it, right? So it's it uniform rather than just being truly random? Yeah. Well, <laughs> truly random is not a mathematical term, right? But like, if you're sampling from a uniform distribution, that's not the same as a Gaussian distribution. Or if you're sampling from the mean, that's clearly not a Gaussian distribution. So the, the, e the laziest way of getting a Gaussian distribution is sampling from something you already know to be Gaussian, the original data set. I mean, the, the second laziest method is to like figure out what the, the mean and standard deviation of your original data set was, and then draw from that function, which would be the second laziest method. But <laughs> those are the two methods that I would endorse as far as like getting the original distribution. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> lambda functions. There's been a request. I will add it to my to-do list. I think I have a, I won't be this lecture, but I will get it to you in the next two lectures. Welcome. Yeah, you see them all over the place, and you're like, what the heck is this doing? Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK. Thank you for asking. All right. So I'm going to run uh, some bugs in this code and then show you what to do about them. Let's see if I can get this to work. All right. So. I have a, a notebook here, and it has a bunch of bugs in it. And then we're going to walk through, like, what is the notebook trying to tell you about the bug? So the, the jargon here is that you have a thing called a traceback. It's those pink little windows you're all familiar with from your code. That was a joke. <laughs> so it's trying to tell you where the error is. Obviously, here in the first cell, since we haven't defined the variable A, it's telling us that variable is not defined. So that's a super, that's, you won't get any more clear, right? It's telling you exactly what the problem is and where it is. Those are the best type of tracebacks because you understand that's what I should fix, right? I'm going to walk through this notebook and you'll see like that's not always the case. All right. So often you'll make little Python inconsistencies, right? So we know that a function, when we define it, needs to have a semicolon after it, or a colon rather, and that would be to, to fix the error. We just make it an actual Python code. So that's pretty straightforward. Those are also very simple to fix. I'm going to leave that there. All right. And then the problems that I don't like as much, Python tries to find a problem, but then it reports to you the wrong line of the code. All right. So here I have a function definition, and then it's complaining about this return statement indentation to the match. That's that's misleading at best, right? Because it's not actually the error that is causing the problem, right? So the uh, the errors that are present are the fact that it's missing a sem uh, colon, and the indentation is not consistent. But all the traceback can tell you is what's the last error that is sort of encountered in this profiling of all the problems. Well, this cell. Errors, and usually, if you look at it, you, you know where it stops and it's 
yeah, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know how the pro, uh, how the interpreter works exactly at that level, but yeah, it's not basically the takeaway message here is it's not always going to tell you where the actual bug is, and so the usual like if you see something that you're super confident like this return statement, there's nothing wrong with it. I can guarantee that. So then my default action is I look at the line above. Is there anything wrong wrong there? And I basically work my way up and say are there are there bugs or differences in the code above where it's reporting the error. That's the, the next natural place to look when Python's reporting an error. All right, so we'll make a list, and then we'll try and, so this, this bug I'm gonna introduce to you, that's not Python's fault, that's your fault, right? You're trying to access the element of a list that doesn't exist. Python's like, I don't even know where you're talking about. All right, so again, that's not something that Python can fix, that's a programmer issue. So it's like the worst, the worst bugs are not Python's fault, they're your fault. Good news is if you, want, if you sort of like anticipate, oh, someone could do something stupid at this point, a natural thing to use is the try accept pattern. So this is, I want to try a thing, but if it fails, do this. All right, so in this case, I'm handling the error by saying, hey, user, there's an issue here. All right, so that's, that's the way of, trying something that you think may have some issues, and then if that doesn't work, here's a way of catching the error. So when you write these try accept statements, the important thing is you need to know what type of error you're gonna encounter. And you don't always, and you can handle the generic case, but it's always best to handle, if you think it's gonna be an index error, then catch the index error in your, in your try accept statement. So here, I happen to know that I'm gonna probably run into an, ex, an index error, because someone's going to put a silly number in there, and therefore I'm going to catch that. What that leaves you with, if someone else introduces an error that you weren't looking for, then it won't catch that, and it will just break your program. So it's best to be as narrowly focused on what type of errors you think are going to happen, rather than trying to catch the generic error. All right, all of that was very simple because I introduced a, a bug within like two lines of code, and more often you are writing many lines of code and your bug is gonna look something a little bit more complicated. So typically you'll have a function that relies on another function or a module that depends on another module, and that's where the traceback functions get real fun to read. Look at how much extra traceback we have to parse through, right? Like we have to go now trace back and figure out what is going on here. And so as usual, start at the bottom and work your way up. Python's trying to tell you what function's called what in order to figure out where the error might be. All right, so let's look at our original code here. So I have a function which takes a list and then prints the fifth element, or returns the fifth element, sorry. And then I have um, another function which takes two arguments and then calls our first function, passing the list that was passed in as argument and returns a value. So pretty complicated code, right? It's two nested functions. Um, so the traceback error, so we can figure out what the error is here. So it, it tried to access the, that list element that doesn't exist, and so it's telling us that pretty directly, um, and it's telling you how it got there from the original call. Okay. Right, so then usually what I'll do is I'll try and like, the way I debug code when I'm not exactly sure what's going on is I'll insert a bunch of extra print statements, and the print statements tell me where in the code am I executing right now? And so that's the way that I debug the execution flow rather than trying to do the opposite path, which is using the traceback to go backwards. So you can go in both directions in your code, the way that your program is being executed and the way that the, ex that the bug was triggered. Those are two different routes to get to the same place. Okay, mm, let's see. Then I can be really fancy, I can now that I know where I think my bug is, I can put in my try accept statement and everything's happy. All right, so there I didn't get that trace back, but my program didn't actually complete the way I wanted, but at least it didn't, you know, break. Okay. Uh, this last bit here is basically about types and type checking. This is the other thing that you'll probably run into for bugs is you're expecting a string and someone passes you a dictionary. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't, right? And so if you're looking for the first element of a dictionary and the first element of a string, you may get something back, but it won't be the thing you expect. 
So usually in Python, we try and figure out, um, we try and write functions that don't depend on data types. Um, but sometimes you're in the situation and you need to use a is instance. So that's the takeaway here. OK. I think that's all I want to deliver there. Uh, yeah. And then the other tip I'm going to give you is a set of checklists. So we have covered a lot of material in this course. Like, <laughs> there's been a lot of different topics. And, in, and unless you've taken really good notes of, from all the, the lectures, it's hard to remember all the things come into play when you're looking at a new data set. So with that in mind, someone invented a couple of different checklists. So these are like generic questions that whatever the data set is and whatever you're trying to solve from that data set, these checklists kind of like remind you to do like, did I, did I do sanity checks? And did I talk to the data owner to see if they're competent and you know understand what they're giving you? So the checklists are very helpful as a way of reminding yourself what you should be doing. They're sort of best practices for data science. And a big hint, you could use those on your projects. <laughs> and so the other thing in these, in these checklists, you'll see um, things referenced that I haven't talked about in course. I apologize for that. There's many more things than we can talk about it in one class, but uh, there are some references here to things that we haven't covered. All right, out of the actual picture. All right, yeah, so I guess the big news, Monday, November 4th, project two. So that's when that's due. I'll be posting your code online, on the internet. Um, <laughs> if that embarrasses you, write a better project too. <laughs> and I'm available, right? So like the, the best resource, as far as you're concerned, is to come to me and say, Ben, what do you think about this? And I tried this, but that didn't work, and this visualization isn't quite the way I wanted. Can you turn it a little bit with me, right? Like that's what I'm here for. It's not. I don't want you to be like in isolation, just working on your project, hoping it works. Like I want to help you. So, but I rely on you to tell me what it is that you need. So, um, you know, what time is convenient to meet? Where do you want to meet? What do you want to talk about? The things I can help with. Uh, yeah, that's it. All right. So we're going to load a Python function into a notebook. Uh, the utility there is that you'll occasionally encounter things that you need to run over and over and over in different data sets. And rather than just copy pasting code, you can have this little library of techniques.py that you just load into random notebooks. I'm going to talk about uh, some regular expressions. Who here has not heard of regular expressions? All right, two, one. So almost everybody has regular expressions exposure. That's great. Um, Hmm? Yes. All right. We'll we'll get you past today. Oh yeah. Okay. So apparently I missed this one. Let's use a function in a notebook. Okay. So one of the functions that I find myself using over and over is this. Uh, so I'm gonna, I mean, by the way, I'm using this baseball data set. I think I've seen. I think we've seen it before. My favorite thing to do with the data set personally, is to figure out what are the unique entries in every column. That's a really quick way of just scanning through the data, assuming you have one variable per column. <clears throat> and so I can scan through that, and that snippet of code, rather than having to try and remember what it is every time, I would like to just have it uh, in a Python function that I could call later. I'm going to show you how to do that. So uh, cat here is a a function that displays the contents of a file. So I've taken my functions.py, and in that text file, I've put some Python code. So I'm just showing you basically what's in the file. So now that I have that file, I can do different things with it. So this cell magics, these are Jupyter specific things, and basically they allow you to import code from other files. So that's pretty tricky. Now that I've got the function loaded in from that file using the run command, I can reference that file. Cat is a command that only Linux can, but the run is a cell magic for Jupyter, so it's uh, operating system independent. So the cool thing is I've, I've taken that content in the file, and I've made it available to me. And so that means I can reference it here. 
and that runs as you'd expect. It runs the same function because that code is just the function in a file. So you're thinking, great, I've solved all the problems. I have code that I can just give to different notebooks. The problem is, if you're using this run function, it kind of hides what the file contents are. It doesn't actually show you what functions were made available. So you sort of have to have a mental model of what's in your file and, and what, what can you call. Exactly. So there's this other thing, which is cool. So load my functions.py, it does what we're looking for. It actually makes that code available in the notebook as uh, a cell of code. So that's, that's way different, right? Rather than just loading it off of disk, it makes it into a cell with code. That's like magically creating code from a file. It's pretty cool. The pro <laughs> there's a trade-off, though, right? Now that you've loaded it into the notebook, it's separated from its original source. So if you, huh? Copy pasted. But the problem is you're now disconnected, right? The, if you make a change to this, that doesn't get copied back into your original text file. So there's this trade-off of like, do you want to reference the code um, on disk and then like have that um, in one place, or do you want to load it in your, in your notebook? Yes. You could, yeah, exactly. Yeah. OK, so that's just a little trade-off if you find yourself running the same code over and over in the same in the different notebooks. All right. All right, so this lecture, we're going to talk about um, clustering. If you've already taken the 602 course, you may have already heard all this stuff. And so I apologize if it's pretty slow. If you guys are getting pretty sleepy, I will speed up and we'll try and get through the clustering tech portion because it's uh, it's pretty straightforward, I think. So last lecture, we talked about linear regression. That applies basically in two different contexts, either taking a data set and extending the range of applicability or uh, fitting a curve and then trying to add new data points in that same range. So it's the same technique, but the way in which you apply it, you know, you can be cool and call yourself a machine learning expert if you're doing this part. So <laughs> that's, that's like unfortunate, but it's the same technique and in different contexts. So I'm using it as a springboard to say, like, we've already done a little bit of machine learning. Clustering is primarily in the machine learning realm um, because it's a statistics approach to data analysis. So we find ourselves, we already did uh, linear regression. Now we're going to move over to the other side of the tree here of unsupervised uh, learning with uh, clustering. All right, so clustering, it's a mess. There's a bunch of different choices. The way in which you apply, or which choice you make here, sort of depends on the problem you're trying to solve and the data set you have. All right, so why do we care? Well, so you're going to open up a notebook, or your, uh, so your, your, your uh, laptop, and then go to a web browser and open up yippee.com. This is, <laughs> I guarantee no one here has used the yippee search engine on their computer. Is that true? <laughs> OK, once you get there, then you can uh, search for the term data science. All right, and can someone volunteer and tell me what it is that they see on the left-hand side of their browser? Of topics, right? So, so what they're it, it's it's unlike the search engines you're probably used to using, whether it's DuckDuckGo or Google or whatever AltaVista. So, the great thing here is it's clustering different topics that are related to the term you searched. And so, I find this pretty useful if um, there's different ways in which that same phrase is used. It can identify the different ways of that. So, that's a pretty neat idea. So, we'll cover that a little bit tonight. The other use um, for clustering is market segmentation. So the utility here is if I'm an advertiser and I want to sell you a product, if I tell everyone the same story, it's not going to have as much impact as if I say, oh, you're a UMBC student. Yeah, that means you're this old and you have this much money, right, and you're interested in these concerns. Therefore, I'm going to tell you a story that's specific to your needs. And your needs are likely to be way different than someone who's retired, living at home, has a pension, and just cares about you know what's on TV. So 
that's a different story to that different person, even though I'm trying to sell the same product. So the way that I can leverage that is if the um, story is tailored to the audience, it's more likely to sell a product. The way I identify that is all these different people have the same attribute. Right? So I need to be able to partition out who's in what groups and what groups exist in the first place. All right. So and the last, I think the last application I have is like, if you're looking for anomalies, a really convenient way of doing that is making groups of similar things, and then what doesn't belong to any of those groups. Pretty straightforward idea. All right, clustering methods. We've got two main approaches. One is you take all of your data, and then you divide it into little subgroups, and you say, do those groups make sense? And the other is to say, I've got a bunch of different little things. How do I put those together into groups and then cluster them together? So it's basically either divide or add. Agglomerative, like add, partition, split up. Okay. So then uh, within the hierarchical algorithms, basically you can uh, divide or add. That's basically what I was talking about there. Okay, and then the activity for you is to implement this. So I'm going to go back. And I'm going to tell you this. Which one? This one or that one? All right. Sorry. We're so agglomerative. I got a little ahead of myself. Agglomerative is you start with everybody separated, and then you figure out: Am I like you? Am I like you? Am I like you? And if the answer is yes, you form a little group and you form other groups by adding in more people. No. Similarity, maybe. Uh, divisive clustering is where you start with everybody in one group and then like divide them in half and say, is that a good partition? OK. Based on whatever the thing you care about is. In this case, um, I'm going to care about your name. So. <laughs> So we're going to start out with isolated students spread out across the room. It means you have to get up and move. <laughs> so spread out evenly ac among, across the wall, just like spread out. You know, if you can put your hands out and not touch anybody, it means you're spread out. <laughs> Don't stand by me. I'm sick. <laughs> OK, we've got everybody spread out. <laughs> so what I am aiming for you to do is form into groups where the letter of your first name, or the number of letters in your first name is the same. And so that means everybody operating independently will have to ask everybody else around them, how many letters do you have in your first name? And then if you have the same number of letters, then you're forming a group of like two. And if you're forming a group of two, now you have to find another person who has the same number of letters in their first name. Good? All right. Got it. <laughs> no. Uh, well known. Okay. So, does anyone have any observations about this activity now that we've done it? What can anybody say? What the observations were? How did that roll out? Okay. So there's a lot of communication going on. What else? The algorithm, right? The rules of implementation of making a decision were very straightforward. Um, the other thing that I would observe is that there was a lot of concurrency. So people weren't operating serially, but they weren't taking turns, right? They were all acting at the same time. So the clustering algorithm here was very, very straightforward to like parallelize on a computer that has lots of cores, right? The last observation is there were a bunch of people finishing right away, and then like a few people took longer, and then like the last people, like they were all by themselves, right? And so this non uniform time elapsed. That's what I was observing. That's very normal. So like you'll have someone who takes a lot longer, 
And basically, if you're waiting for your algorithm to finish, do you know what you have to wait for? The last one. Right? So like, the number of decisions is not uniform, right? Everybody is not making the same number of decisions, therefore the execution time is not the same for everyone, which means your algorithm runs as long as it takes the longest one to run. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the the last uh, sketch that I'll do is basically partition algorithms. So just to review, we covered the hierarchical algorithms. That's what we just did one of them. And we're going to do the other one later in class, so you'll have exposure to that. Okay, the last one is partition algorithms. Basically, you just form a random group and ask, was that a good choice? And then you move on and say, like, yes, it was or no, it wasn't. Okay, so now let's let's actually do some math, maybe. I'm going to make some random data on the board. And then I'm going to ask somebody here who has not taken uh, 602. Who here has not taken 602? All right. So someone would like to self-select out of group um, to come up to the whiteboard. All right. <laughs> I'll label my axes. All right. So a question for you is, can you draw circles around three groups of points that are clustered? So basically, identify three groups of data. Three groups? Yeah, so just circle the three groups. OK. All right, now, thank you very much. How did you do that? Um, so I just was in that uh, checking the distances of the groups, I assume that this is the nearest. The distance between them is the nearest, so I assume that this will be one group, and you and the other two groups are the lowest distance. So okay, so so you're using some sort of visual analysis to figure out what is the distance between these points and these points and these points. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Round of applause. <laughs> so <laughs> this is like the magical part, right? She knew, and very intuitively, this algorithm. That's pretty. So, so basically, the, the fancy name for this algorithm that she just used is called k-means. And it's a distance-based measurement technique for clustering. So I'm going to formalize the process that she used. And it's going to sound a little bit more formal. But uh, it's the same algorithm. So basically, I gave her the guess. I said, let's guess that there's three clusters. That's an arbitrary choice. I could have said four or two. And then, I, then what she did is she guessed the location of where those centers are and looked at the distance from the center of that group to where the points were. That's it. So it's pretty straightforward. All right, so how does this work uh, uh, in a notebook? So I'm going to take this data, which is gray, and assign some randomly placed centers to it. Let's see if I can pull up an actual notebook. Uh, that I call it? Yeah. What did I call it? Iterations. All right, we'll skip over all the math and do the pretty pictures. All right, so the first step is that I need to assign some randomly placed centers. into my, my data points are the gray points. And here you can see it's pretty straightforward. There's four clusters, and I assigned four data points. My guesses were not very good. Right? But I did have to initially guess that there were four. That's like a human input. And then what I do is I take, for each of these things called centroids, I measure what is the distance between them and all the other points. Uh, question? OK. If, if you do want to talk to your partner, just like type on the keyboard. It's easier. So this is called a centroid. And basically, I measure the distance between this and all the other points. And the points that are closest to that one, I assign those to that color green. So that's, that's now a, a group. And I do the same thing for the other points here. 
what are the points closest to that one and this one and this one? I'm just even, evenly partitioning them out. So it's a pretty uh, like straightforward choice. It's very simple to understand. There's a lot of math about how many, how, what is the distance between this point and this point, this point and that point, this point and that point. Right. And you just flip a coin. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not understanding. Do you have a question? Yes. Like for let's say you are identifying the green group. Yeah. So you check the distance with each and every point, or you created a group and checked the distance of. No, I checked the distance with all the points, and these are the points that are closest to the green point. So it's it's just basically splitting out. This point here is not very close to green, so it's not going to go in green. Each centroid. Yeah. What do you mean having purple? Are you saying that this centroid here is very close to this green point? Yes, and that green point is closer to this green centroid. Yeah, but. Yes. Yep. So the I, my choice was how many centroids do I get to put down, and then I just randomly place them on the grid. And then I ask for each point which centroid is nearest to it, and I assign it that one. So that's that's a lo a lot of sort of like very simple math, but a lot of it. And then I make a now I make a move. I move my centroid to the center of the group of the same color. So previously, you'll notice that all the centroids were pretty closely together. And so the center of the blue group is way up here. So I'm going to move that blue centroid to the center of the cluster. All right. So then I do that same process where now I've got my centroids in a new position. I recalculate all the distances for all the points. And I ask, is this point here closer to the blue centroid or the green centroid? It's closer to the blue, it's a blue group. So I'm moving the centroids, then I'm reassigning all the group uh, per centroid. Yep. I move it. And hopefully, every time that centroid distance is moving slightly less. That means you have, uh, it's approaching the, the expe expected outcome. So eventually, the distance by which you move the centroid is so small that you're done. And then you hope that you make the right guess of number of clusters. So. So final clustering turns out pretty good for this fake data. We're happy. So for the case, you just randomly select the number from the test? <laughs> that is a good leading question, which will take us into the next phase. Okay. Yes. So here I, I I did make a judicious choice. It's called a judicious choice of, oh, I'm just going to guess four. That happens to be correct. Right? But you could also run the same algorithm for like five or six or two. And you get the results that don't look as correct, maybe. But we'll see how that works out. Uh, so it, you mean this step? Yeah, so in this step, you ask, what is the center of all of your blue data points? And then you move your centroid to that location. Yes, programmatically, absolutely. So where that is all happening, uh, this is so commonly used, they put it into a library called sklearn. So we're using sklearn both for making the, the fake data, and we're using this pairwise distances argument. So that fancy function does all the different pairwise operations to figure out what the differences are between all the different data points. And that's how it figures out where the center of the grouping is to move the centroid. So yeah, good question. And so all of this is uh, code stolen from another person. So I won't walk through it. But basically, it's just drawing the centers and some fake data points and then stepping through the algorithm here to figure out all those steps I was telling you about. So it's measuring all pairwise distances and figuring out where the centroids should be.
Okay, so she asked, what is the x and y axes of this? They're just some, in, yes, they're just random data. What, what's the question? <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> All right, well, if I don't, hold me accountable. All right, so a question that Cam had was, how do we guess, or how do we, um, or what, or I think someone else was asking, how do we guess those initial centroid positions? And the answer is, we just randomly stated, I'm going to make it these, these different locations. And that may lead you to an incorrect solution. And so the way to account for the fact that your initial guess was random was to repeat the algorithm many times. And so each time, I'm going to randomly place my centroid. And that will get you potentially a different outcome. But if you do enough different initial guesses of your centroid location, you'll hopefully converge upon a, a good solution. So that was point number one. What if you have like infinite number of so where did you get one from? Well, <laughs> yeah, uh, this math is a bunch of different uh, addition and multiplication, so it's very easy to run many times. And you typically have a finite data set of like, you know, a million points or something. So like, even though it sounds like a lot, Python's really fast. And k-means is a very efficient algorithm, so you typically don't run into computational problems with k-means. Even though, I mean, I understand it's a lot, right? You're measuring all the distances of all the points on every step for a bunch of different initial guesses. That sounds like a lot, but it typically won't be more than a few seconds. But that's the, okay, so the first point that this is addressing, this random guesses, that was one point. We're going to get to that one. All right. So typically you don't visualize the entire sequence of k-means, you just push the button and run the program. I'm, I'm making all the steps very explicit so that you understand what the algorithm is doing, but typically you don't plot all the intermediate steps. Yeah, especially if you have like 37 dimensional data and a million data points, watching it is going to be super boring. Okay, so back to the Cam's question, which was how do we know how many initial uh, clusters to guess for? Right, and the answer is you do a bunch of different initial guesses for how many clusters there are, and then look at how fast that uh, convergence of your centroids is. So first I guess that there's just one uh, one cluster, and then I guess that there's two clusters, and I guess that there's three clusters, and I guess that there's four clusters. And when I run this algorithm, the number of times that I have to run the, the, the operations, that will tell me how quickly it's converging towards a solution. And so you'll find that it happens to be very quick when it's the right number of clusters. But if you overguess, it'll also be very quick. So that's why it's called the elbow. If you sort of have to look at where is it converging, and then that initial kink, that's where your, where your good number of guesses is. And for this data set, it's totally obvious to guess that there should be four. But again, when you have like many, many dimensions of data, guessing the number of dimensions sort of visually is not going to happen. I think I have that here. Yeah, so I won't run. I mean, this is the same code. And I'm just looping over how many different uh, clusters there how many different clusters there should be so here's a I'm guessing between one and seven that's a guess I'm making but now I'm looking at the number of uh, steps it took to converge and that's where this plot comes from so same code I'm now not visualizing the whole set of steps but I'm just looking at the number of steps it takes okay and I think it's time yeah so I'm gonna close out with oh, almost done so we've got this elbow, and then the last thing is once you've got these clusters, what are the clusters describing, right? Are they a whole bunch of students at UMBC versus retirees? How do we know what's going on in these different clusters? And basically, <laughs> there's you already know one answer, which is look at all the data points in that cluster and figure out what the common characteristics are. That's a simple data characterization problem. And if you see, like, all these people have ages between 25 and 35, and they're in Catonsville. OK, they're probably not retired, um, right? So like coming up with labels based on just the data characterization is a pretty straightforward step. Uh, if you've been in 6.2 or heard of decision trees, this is another way of taking your clusters of data and identifying what attributes are most representative 
of your data. So it, I will not be covering decision trees, but um, that's another method. Okay. Now it's time for a break. All right. <laughs> All right. So we'll come back. We'll be back at 8.05. I have a marker. Yeah. yeah. I just have an order with Max. Okay. So, so there was this comment like incorrect sampling for. Uh -huh. Wow. Uh, so I've tried to do this sam sampling for this like. What I did for sampling was uh, I've selected a random value in the data frame. Oh, oh I see. Okay, so you <laughs> you took that column yeah. and you randomly selected a value in there. Yeah. Okay, all right. Can you just send me an email and tell, like remind me to change your grade? Yeah, sure. I didn't write. Yeah, sorry. I I, I, cle I keyed in on this fact and I didn't realize you were yeah the calendar. My apologies. All right. Thank you. I just have to drop you an email. Yeah, yeah. And I'll change your grade. Thank you. 
Okay, I think everybody's back, so we'll get started. So I, I've just spent an hour of your life talking about data that is numeric. Most of the clustering that we do is not numeric, it's text-based. So you can also apply it to text data, it's a little crazier, but most of the clustering, it's if it's numeric, it's super easy, don't worry about it. But most of the real problems are in text documents. Because typically, if you're given a thousand text docs, and this like has happened, this is a project that we worked on at work. We had like 10,000 CSVs show up, right? I don't actually want to look through 10,000 CSVs and figure out what's in the CSVs. Like that's a ridiculous problem. So if you're given a bunch of PDFs or web page or Word documents, and you don't have the time or you don't have the staffing to have other people read the documents, you're going to have to apply some data science. So basically, if you just tried counting words in those documents, that would be a very poor representation of the clustering of the documents. So definitely don't waste your time with that type of thing. So we're going to talk about unstructured data in text. And it's a very, very difficult field because the way we speak to each other as humans is very not computers. Right? Like <laughs> We talk about things very ambiguously. If I tell you, like, go pick up the dog, that sentence doesn't make sense if you don't know what the dog is or where it is, or like whose dog is it, do I have to pay anyone? Like all these different sort of like subtleties that we just talk to each other and like we know that, right, because we're humans. But computers don't have that luxury, so <laughs> text is just terrible. All right, so typically we focused on things like JSON and XML and CSVs. Those have a little bit of structure. It's, you know, usually they have structure, but your text documents, they do not. So they have things like grammar and spelling. Those aren't the same thing. All right, so 
Spelling is terrible because it always has, has exceptions, right? If you try and have a rule of grammar, it's not going to be consistent. And I don't care what language you speak, it's not consistent. So if you try and write a computer program that takes all the rules of grammar and implements them, it will be a very difficult program to write. And then even when we spell words wrong, we still know what we mean. Right? If I use the wrong spelling of dog and it's D-O-O-G, I can probably interpolate from the context that you meant D-O-G. But again, trying to handle all the complexity of the computer is super hard. So I'm just setting up the fact that we need to do something a little bit smarter than just count the number of letters in a word. Okay, and there's even like little subtle things of like, well, at least I know that sentences end with periods, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> right? So like, if I just take this and I separate on these little point things, those little characters, and I say, the number of sentences is the number of these little point things. Right? But then I have other sentences which are much, much worse. Right? So I have something like Dr. Stark, and I use an abbreviation, and I have another acronym, and then, uh, you know, that number of periods is, has nothing to do with number of sentences. So, like, again, trying to write rules on even what you think is straightforward, it doesn't work out. So, <laughs> natural language processing is sort of our first view into complexity of things that are not just simple counting. Right? So, the great news is you've had other people before you on this path. It's a pretty well understood domain. So, there's a natural language toolkit which I think is from Stanford University. So really smart people have already worked on this problem before you, which means you get to use their libraries. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> right? Be lazy. All right. So we're going to start on a slightly simpler problem, which is just given some text, find patterns in the text. And if you all know about regular expressions already, this is going to be pretty straightforward. All right. So again, go to your web browser, open up library.umbc.eu, and who here is not is not familiar with the control F function on the other web browser? Control F. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Find. <laughs> Search for the word loan in that page, right? And you can do that. Hopefully everybody's good on that. So if you can find a string in a text document, you've made success, right? We've got something. But now, now I ask the Ben of like, what if your data is more complicated, right? What if you're looking for phone numbers or email addresses where like they have a bunch of numbers, but you don't even know what the phone number is before you look for it, because otherwise you'd just type it in, right? Like, like if you're looking for all the phone numbers, control F is not gonna suit you. So this is where we depart as data scientists from normal people. Normal people know about find. They can search PDFs, they can search <laughs> you don't want to be a normal person. Normal people are boring. So if you have a Word document or a PDF or a web page, you can use Control F and find text. That makes you a normal person. We're going to try and make you not a normal person in this case. OK. So we, as data scientists and humans, already know that these sort of have structure, right? It's like three numbers and a dash and some more numbers and then more numbers. That's a phone number. And the same thing for emails, where it's like some strings and then an at symbol, and then more characters, and then a dot, and then three characters. So if you can identify that there is a pattern in this string, but I don't know exactly what the actual characters are, that's where we're going to start out with. All right, so that's just what I was describing. That's sort of like the English version of a regular expression. It's a thing, and then a thing, and then another thing. And if you can describe what that pattern is, you've got a regular expression. All right. So to put this in a slightly more formal language, I could call that a digit, and I'll put a dash slash D as 1 of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We'll just put that as a slash D. And then a phone number takes the form of DDD dash DDD dash DDDD. So that was a very straightforward search for a phone number using our new language. Our language is regular expressions. And then an alternative, if you don't like slash D, is you have these square braces in the range 0 to 9. So in regular expressions, there's as many ways as you can think of to describe your format. It's, it, that's what makes reading a regular expression very difficult. All right, so let's look at an actual use of it. Mm -hmm. 
be slow. All right, RE, regular expression, it's a library. If you haven't seen it, it's really easy to import. I'm going to have some text here. And you'll notice I've already spruced out a little bit of emails and phone numbers in there, so you can sort of like preview. That's what we're going to be working with in this notebook. <laughs> You're close. <laughs> so if I use the, the find 953, that's just working the exact same way as we use the find in our, in our web browser example. So I just search for an exact string. It will find all the exact string matches. Nothing shocking there. RE. I'll make that up. Yep. That's uh, the library we imported is regular expressions. Uh, that one I don't have an answer for. Yep. I'm not sure. Let's see if we can run it. I'm gonna I'm gonna experiment to enlighten my and see if I can come up with an answer. Mm, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know the answer, but I'm gonna try and confirm it in the next one. Okay. <laughs> so in the next example, I'm gonna find all the things that match this pattern that I was previewing in the slides. So it's gonna find this one and this one, even though I was only looking for things with digits in them. So let's run that, and that works. I think if I remove the R, it will not work. No? OK, whatever. I'll have some homework to do. I will look that up. All right, so basically, I was just passing in that huge blob of text and searching it for the regular expression. OK. So there's, as I mentioned, you could search for a bracket range of between 0 and 9. That would be another way of specifying digits. Another one is I can even get more concise. Rather than typing slash d slash d slash d, I can say put three slash d's in there. So it's another way of representing the same problem. Yeah. Characters, you can do that. Like, let's put a 2 at the bottom, at the end here. So if I put in 2 and a 3 here, it'll only return one of them. So I can mix regular expressions and just regular straight characters. All right, so now we get into the fun part. So phone numbers are relatively straightforward. There's only a few variations to them. Emails, right, so it's going to be something with an at symbol and then some characters. Um, if I only specify A through Z, it's going to return that at symbol and a single character, because it's only looking for A through Z in one character position. What I really wanted, what's called a greedy search, was I wanted A through Z characters until you find something other than an A through Z character. And so here, let's look back at our original text. Uh, the email address is in this block of text were my names at sc.edu, and what was the other one? A person at farm.com. So basically what happened is when we did a greedy search, it looked for A through Zs until it couldn't find any more of them. In this case, it encountered a .ed or .com, and that's where it stopped matching. And it didn't automatically Correct. OK, so now on the other side of that mat symbol, maybe we want to look for the actual uh, email address. We can put that same A through Z unbounded the greedy search here, and then find the, that, um, the, the name at the domain. OK, so then we have to include a period in order to get the actual email address. And a period is a special character in a regular expression, which is why it's preceded by a slash. So now, now I've actually got a regular expression that works for some email addresses. But this is where you're, you're encountering problems, because if this is what you think all the email addresses work, work for, You've never seen an email address with a number or an underscore in it or a period. And so in order to co handle more and more complicated email addresses, you'll have to write more and more complicated regular expressions. But if you write more and more complicated ones, you're likely to match on that aren't email addresses. And so if you have a Twitter handle and you accidentally match on a Twitter handle, that's not an email address, even though it has an at symbol in it. So the tricky part when writing a regular expression is writing something that's generic enough not overly generic, such that it matches things you don't care about. And that really depends on having a good corpus of text to work with that has a variety of examples in it. 
All right, so we had a question about how to read regular expressions. And the trick to reading regular expressions is to document them. Gonna, <laughs> I know, right? So notice I had this like really complicated sort of regular expression up there. It's easier, in my opinion, to read it with documentation. And the way that I do that is I can split the regular expression out into a different set of portions here. And then I can document what I intend to capture in the regular expression. So that makes it very clear about what my intent is when I'm writing these regular expressions. Because if I come back in six months and ask, what the heck was I thinking? Right? If I'm looking at this, there's no documentation about what the intent was. But here I can specify what is it that I try and, and do. Uh, that's a that's a string block. It's just, it's just like, so we use the same, uh, no, I didn't. All right. Sorry, I thought I was going to have three quotes up here, but it's just a block of uh, text, multi line uh, it's, it's treating this as a comment within the string. Yeah, yeah. so exactly the same uh, regular expression as we used above, but with commenting. So that's pretty handy. And there's a whole library. So like. If you think that you're going to try and invent a regular expression that matches emails, I've got news for you. All right, so let's look for the word. Let's make this big. All right, and we're going to search for 100 of them. So when I search for emails, I get back 827 different regular expressions that people have submitted as this regular expression matches emails. Like that just gives you an idea of like how the complexity of email addresses and trying to filter out those is a tough job. Right, let's do a search for phone numbers and see how many like phone numbers I think will be worse. That'll be my prediction. Yeah, two th so for phone numbers, right, which I think it's just a bunch of numbers. What could possibly go wrong? Well, there's country codes, codes, extensions, everything else goes with phone numbers, right? They're, they're very hard to handle. So there's 2,700 different regular expressions for a phone number. So. <laughs> I always recommend looking to what experts do rather than trying to invent it yourself. And try and come up with a regular expression for a phone number. All right. Yeah. And then the really fun part is you can use regular expressions for search and replace, which is pretty handy because if I want to search for all of the last four digits of a phone number and replace those with a triple X, that'd be great if I want to do anonymized data. All right. So I can just search for things that look like phone numbers and then replace those. It's pretty handy. I've got squinty eyes over here from April. No, oh. <laughs> All right. So that's it. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Questions on regular expressions. Everybody comfortable? Good. All right. So this, so this, I, I just found this amusing. So like, somebody working in uh, biology, working with gene sequences said, you know what, gene sequences are strings. And so I'm going to search for the gene sequence that I care about using a regular expression. This, is, this was brilliant, right? So I, I was like, this is super impressive. It means that you don't have to restrict your use of regular expressions to the domain that you think it's applying to. It's wherever there's text. So that was pretty neat. Yeah, there's a lot of good references. This is just in the slide deck, so that you can go back and revisit any one of these. They're at different. They're written at different levels of where the reader is at. So you have to figure out where are you at and where are these websites are. Then not all of them are going to match your needs. All right. So I've just introduced a new problem in your life, which is I've armed you with a new tool. The most common thing that a person does with a new tool is they use it everywhere, and indiscriminately, and that's not good. So you shouldn't just think that, oh, I need to search for things. I'll use a regular expression. Only use regular expressions where you have to, right? where you're forced into it. Because they're complicated, and they don't always do what you expect, and they're not as powerful as you want. And so with all these caveats, you shouldn't always use regular expressions for searching. That's my statement there. Okay. So sometimes the thing you're looking for is more complicated than even a regular expression can handle. And the most common examples of that are HTML and XML. 
So if I were to give you an XML document and I said search for blah, 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 you should not immediately spring to an, a regular expression for that search. It would be better to use beautiful soup because beautiful soup actually parses the HTML document as HTML and then extracts all the entities out of the HTML document rather than trying to write a good regular expression for HTML. So where that applies, um, I'm going to hand it off to my computer science counterparts because like, what is a language versus what is a regular language? Those are computer science questions I don't have before, but that's a whole thing in computer science about what is a language. So it's basically how much structure is there in recursion. Okay, time for you guys to get some exercise. <coughs> All right, you know what's going to happen, right? Got to do a thing. So you're going to get up. And you're going to form a group. And this is hard because we're all in a big classroom with a bunch of tables in it. But I'm going to have you form up as a group under the clock. Nice and well packed. You're going to have to get a little bit smaller. I need more space. <laughs> Cluster up. You don't all have to face me, right? You can huddle up together. Like, there's going to be layers. <laughs> OK. So this algorithm is very different, which is why I'm having you do a different thing. All right. So we've got a single group of people. That's you. You're all in a group, right? And so the first question that I'm going to ask in this divisive clustering is, what should be the first thing that we do? Yeah, so we have to divide by two. How are we going to do that? Huh? Well, so it, yes, you're going to you're going to split in two different directions, but on what rule? Right? What is the guy? What is the decision that we're going to make to split the groups? Right? Can't be like red shirts and green shirts because we're trying to get length of name. Huh? <laughs> okay, so the goal. Sorry, maybe I didn't make this explicit. The Goal is to make those same groups that we had before. So we're going by first. OK, so less than five, more than five. OK, so let's do less than five over on this side of the room and more than five over here. Less than five, more than five. Ah, now we have a problem. OK, five or less, five or less. So you actually have to move, right? Get out, get away. <laughs> More than five over on this side. <laughs> so five or less over here, and we've got more than five over on this side. Yes, we're good. All right. So now, now I'm gonna re-ask. Like I'm gonna try and do this at the same time. But this group, what's a good decision question? Yeah, we, you are going to split up again. What's it going to be deciding on? Four or less? Four or less go further that way. OK, at the same time, this group, what's a good decision question? But you, OK. Seven or less go that way, but stay separate from them. And more than seven go that way. <laughs> OK, you, and you guys, are, can you split any more or not? Can you guys split any more? OK. Are you, I, don't, I don't see the group division here. Where is the division? <laughs> I see one long stretch of people. Is that, is that right? OK, there we go. Are there any more divisions within this group? You good? And you guys, are any more decisions? Eight and nine over here, and then we're, oh you, yeah yeah. So split on eight and nine. Okay, so split on six and seven. <laughs> All right. Now have, have we arrived back at the same groups? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Additional splitting over here. All right, 
Good job. So now you just ran through divisive clustering. Yeah. And so what were what were the differences? What were the differences that you guys observed? Okay. And what were the steps? More time consuming. Okay. There's a little bit of coordination here, right? So there's like a central control, and I had to make some decisions that I requested from you guys. But the decisions basically said like, if I made a bad decision, like three and less or four and more, like you know, the decisions that you make uh, influence how many decisions you have to make. So making a good choice about where to split, you're aiming for like equally sized groups. So five and five and less and more than five, right? That was a reasonable choice. But every time you're making a decision, you're sort of like uh, having a count of how many steps you take. And the central control is another factor, right? So like those rules have to be distributed out. There wasn't much work for you to do other than like physically move into separate groups. Okay. Thank you. When would <laughs> I'll I'm gonna add that to my list of questions. When do you need to use it? So Okay, so so this so you asked basically what are the applications, and so what we've done so far is numerical clustering, so that would not apply to the searching for similar topics because that was on text, and that wouldn't apply to market segmentation necessarily, unless you're looking at features like age or income, right? Any attribute of a person that could be divided numerically, that'd be where I could apply it. And then the last application, which is numerical, is looking for anomalies. Right. So if I'm looking for some anomaly in the number of packets being sent over the network, and I see an outlier, it's with respect to a cluster. Does that answer the question? OK, thank you. The question there was, what are the applications of why we would do this? I'll, I will take the action to figure out who uses divisive clustering and for what. OK, so oops, <laughs> I shouldn't do this. OK, so. Back to our text processing. So typically, we've got um, some strings, and now we want to identify the relevant words. This is our first task, usually, with text analysis. So I've intentionally written this huge blob of text that like no one wants to read, and it's super weird. right? So like, don't read that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the cool thing about this is that there are obviously some words that are less relevant than other words. Right? And so what we want is a way of identifying which words do we not care about. Because if you identify words are more relevant, then those are more likely to be the topics that you're trying to identify clusters of. So ignore all the words that are grayed out, basically. But then you could ask, how do we know that it's to be grayed out, that we don't care about it, right? And so to sort of like a, a first naive guess is, Short words are irrelevant. And that's a bad rule of thumb, right? So like, especially for Ben, because I only have three characters in my name, <laughs> right? But maybe I care about, you know, guns, and like, that's an important word, even though it's short. And so length of word, again, is just not a good way of identifying uh, where your short, where your stop words are. Let's call it. All right, so luckily, going back to this library that I was advertising earlier, there's a library called NLTK. Natural Language Toolkit. And really smart people have solved this ahead of you. And so you get to rely on their intelligence. So specifically, I'm going to use a library within uh, NLTK called stop words. So stop words are those things that we don't care about typically. They're the words that are irrelevant, like to and from and a or the words you don't care about. I'm also going to use the punctuation library, punct. <clears throat> so uh, this, this blob of text should now look familiar. It's the thing that we were working with earlier. 
So it has words that you can sort of already predict. These are the ones we're going to lose, right? We're going to use, we're going to lose as, are, to, the, is. Those are words that aren't going to set the topic for this. Mm, that I don't have an answer. Not an English major. <laughs> okay. The other cool thing that we can use an LTK for is sentence tokenization. So this was referring to that problem earlier of like, if you break on periods, that's not always the right way to split text into sentences. And so they have this fancy sentence tokenizer that I have no idea how it works. All I know is if I put a big block of text in it, it returns me a list of sentences. That's super handy. So let's run the sentence tokenizer on this big blob of text. I get back a list of the sentences. Amazing. And notice it wasn't as dumb as because it didn't split on a person at farm.com. It recognized this as you know, a thing. Yeah. OK, then I can do word tokenizer. So if I send it a sentence and I say, please split, th split this into words, I can take all those and, and get back the words. So not a big surprise there. So now that I've got all that, <laughs> let's use those stop words. Those are the little interstitial words that I want to get rid of. And I can actually just list out all the stop words from NLTK. And it's a really long list, so I'm not going to scroll through all of it but just to give you an idea. It's all these words in alphabetic order that NLTK thinks are irrelevant for most texts. And again, this is generic, so it might not apply to your text. Maybe the word her is really important for you, and then you shouldn't use NLTK stop words. All right, so once I've got the stop words located, there's only 179 of them. That's amazing, right? I mean, like, those are all the words that we use all the time, but are usually not that relevant. OK, so now I'm going to. This shouldn't surprise you too much. I'm going to split the big block of text into sentences. I'm going to split the sentences into words. And then if that word is not a stop word, then I'm going to put it on my list of words that I care about. All right, so I've got two nested loops. And then I say, in that list of words, if the word that I'm looking at is not a stop word, then add a list. And then it's going to print that list. So this is the same set of sentences as before. And you can sort of make sentence make sense of some of these. Some of them you lose the context, right? So like some tan. I have no idea as a native English speaker what that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have an answer for that one. Let's see what tan was. <laughs> Some are, oh, that, sorry, I'm, I, I forgot to mention, and LTK stop words are all lowercase, so I should have shifted all this to lowercase first. And so, yeah, yeah, sorry, my bad. So some are tan, that sentence got reduced to just some tan. Okay, I think that's all for that one. So that's NLTK, short tour, very easy to use. Okay, so everybody has their own little list of stop words that they think are relevant. So. And and if you really want to get into it, you can make your own list of stop words. And there's mathematical ways to come up with the right list of stop words. And we'll actually cover that a little bit later in class. Basically, if you see the same word showing up in a bunch of different documents, you can probably argue that it's not going to be relevant to most documents. So filtering out, you know, it's back to that knee curve of like if this document has the same word as every other document, then you can just throw that word out. That's usually how stop words are showing up. For my purposes, I'm going to assign you some homework that relies on stop words. I actually don't care what choice you make for the stop words as long as it's a relevant choice. Like, you know, your stop words list shouldn't be the and a. Like, it should actually be, have a pretty long list of stop words. But the specific list of stop words you use for the homework, I don't care. OK. So now as I've sort of shadowed, I've cleaned up my documents, and I've removed the common words from all the documents. Now I want to figure out, I've got 1,000 documents. What are in those 1,000 documents? I don't have time to read them. All right, so we're going to cluster some documents. All right, so term frequency inverse document frequency. It's a big, scary title, but it's a pretty straightforward idea. So it basically takes the words that only show up in a few documents and says, that word, since it only shows up in this document, must be more relevant to that document than the other words. So it basically says, this word doesn't show up in anything else, so I'm going to assign that document to be this topic. 
So if there's a word that shows up in every document, it's probably not the topic of any document. All right. So if you want to think in terms of like a data frame or a matrix or an array, this is the way to think about it. For all of my documents, I have a complete list of all the terms that show up in every document after I remove stop words. And I have a list of documents. And then I can say um, which words show up in which documents. Right. And that is the way that I'll analyze which words are more specific to a given document, given that giant matrix. All right, so let's look at that. Oh, yeah, so I'm <laughs> using essays that so were submitted in the earlier semester. So I've taken your essays, I've cleaned them up by writing all the stop words, and then each document has a list of unique words. All right, good on that. So I'm using your words, I'm using your essays, I've cleaned them up, I've got a list of words from each essay. Let's take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I this is another uh, stolen code example from a website, and interestingly, the website changed, and the the code is no longer there. So, I know. So the idea is, I've got basically term frequency inverse document frequency. The algorithm is in the name of the algorithm. <laughs> so I have to look up term frequency. What does that mean? It asks how many times does a given word show up in a document? Uh, so basically, here's the list of words in my document. I'm looking for that word, and it shows up a third of the time. Okay, so that, that basically is that. And then I can say, how many documents contain a given term? And so I'm going to calculate. Let's say I've got this list. Uh, here I'm presenting this list is one document. This list is another document, and this list is uh, the last document. So I'm sort of like got three documents. I'm representing them as list, and then I can ask, where where does that word show up in my list of lists? So it's a pretty straightforward question. And then uh, inverse document frequency. Uh, I'll try not to read this to you, but basically it's asking, uh, what how common is the word? So this is our our key trick here of like if this word shows up more often in one document and less often. Yeah. So that's that's going to be. Uh, a key here, and I think the last one is we combine all those functions that we just mentioned in this giant statement here, and it gives us a score on each word. So let's run that. I've got this list of essays as a what I call a dat file data. I'm just going to cycle through that. I'll get to the the trick at the outcome, and we'll come back here. So I've got 24 minutes, and I say there's 12. 165 words in all those documents. So that's like my vocabulary for the essays. And I didn't want to read 24 files, so I'll just use TFIDF to figure out what's the topic. So I get a list of all the words. Right. And I run the algorithm, and here's the outcome. So from somebody's week two, uh, I converted it into a list of words. And the most highly scoring word from that document, top five, is fix, naming, learning, entry, and various. OK. Not super helpful. But the interesting thing, the actually more interesting thing to me is at the bottom of this list, like the least uh, relevant words for this essay included the word data. So does anyone have a reason as to why this word would be very irrelevant to the essays? Why? One of the two essays, what you're saying? Well, th no, this this one essay, I'm showing you the most frequent, most relevant words and the least relevant words to so that one essay. So why would the word data show up as a least relevant word? Hmm? Yeah, these were the essays submitted for your homework on data science. Or not. Right. So the term frequency inverse document frequency algorithm says that if this word shows only in this one paper, then that one paper is most associated with that one word. So if there's a word that shows up in all the documents, 
then we can say that that word does not describe the document. So. So let, let's say the word data science shows up in every essay submitted by you for homeworks. Then that is not relevant. It's least relevant. Yeah, so the topic of each. No, 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 no. You're not trying to find the most common topic. You're saying for this essay, what is interesting word in the essay? Most rare. Yes. Well, the. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So the answer I'll give away is because the word data science shows up in every single essay that you submitted for this homework, it's least relevant to all the documents. And then if you look back, so let's look at the next essay. So this essay, the most unusual words in that essay were constraint, idea, suggesting, and perspective. And look at that. Data shows up as another least interesting word for that document. Because again, it's shared with the documents. Included that word. That's right. That's right. OK, so this is a way of sort of distinguishing this paper talks about this topic, and this word, this document talks about this topic. So it's how are the documents different? OK, so again, these scores are relatively low. If you looked across thousands of documents that were very large, you get very, very good um, sampling. Here we only have 24 essays. And the essays were relatively short, you know, 100 words. And so even though you have a relatively small sample with small data, it still works. It's just not very helpful. But if you had thousands of documents that were very long, this would be a great algorithm to use. OK. All right, I think <laughs> I'll be ending a little early because I'm sick. <clears throat> One more. Oh, should we take a break? <laughs> Or just go straight. No, All right. <laughs> All right. So basically, your starting point is always going to be raw text. That's what you're going to have. Oops. Ignore that. Right. So what, what I'm going to give you is a bunch of text documents. And then your responsibility is going to be to remove the stop words. So once you've removed the stop words, then you're going to print out in this special format of the file name and a colon and a word and then another word and another word, right? So I'm only going to get back a list of words from that document that are not stop words. But these aren't, so hopefully I made it clear here that like, even though this word shows up only once in this document, that's what I'm, I'm uh, let's say the word uh, data science shows up many times in the document. I should see data once and science once. And then if the word data science also shows up in this one, it will show up in this list. So the words in this list are unique, but they're not unique across all the documents. So the words of each one are unique to that document? Yes. Yes. So you can have duplication. Yes. Yes. All the words. Okay. Yeah, no punctuation. Uh, I think you can you can remove URLs and phone numbers. <laughs> okay. Questions on that? <laughs> All right. Uh, so the new thing I'm going to ask on this assignment is that as you're working on it, I want you to time how long it's taking you. <laughs> and so I'll get uh, 24 or 25 emails this week saying, Ben, I've worked on the homework for at least one hour, and this is how far I got. or I finished the homework in less than an hour. That's great.
So I'm making it. A, I'm making a break point here of an hour, right? But I should receive 24 emails this week. Basically, I'm trying to gauge how hard is this homework for you. Are you stuck? Right? Have you given up? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you should finish the homework. <laughs> Trying to gauge how far you got in an hour. Yeah, so, so this doesn't just say you should stop. You should keep going. OK. Uh, I'm not, I will check. I think the homework is posted in Blackboard now. OK, and then the last uh, homework assignment here is um, a reading assignment. <laughs> so this is on regular expressions. <laughs> if I said that, I was wrong. <laughs> Huh? All of them? Yeah. Huh? All of them? Yeah. So it says, like, you must mix something less than 100 words. words. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would explain it. All the 700 words, man. Yeah. I think it's like, I extend it to the middle. I was going to use the word. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Okay. Break time. I'm done. Oh, yeah. Don't forget your project.